Tanzania, East Africa. A land of stunning beauty and violent death. Where the fight for survival between predator and prey has raged for millions of years. But now, a hunter is stalking a new prey. Suddenly, people are being targeted by a voracious carnivore. One that will become the most notorious man-eater in over 100 years. Who is this killer? Can it be stopped? Solving this mystery requires two teams of forensic experts. One in East Africa, the other in the United States. These seasoned detectives will revisit attack scenes, analyze disturbing evidence, and uncover clues that will shed new light on these bloody encounters. They will reveal who is the hunter and who is the hunted. Southern Tanzania, the banks of the Rufiji River. At 4 p.m. on August 30th, 13-year-old Amir Ligaza returns from school. He and his mother, Pili, prepare and eat their evening meal and discuss their day. At sundown, Amir goes to bed. I went inside so I can go to sleep. She was still graining the corn outside. She finished at around 10 or 11 p.m. Then she went to the toilet outside. At dawn, Amir awakes to find the hut empty, the door unlocked. His mother is nowhere to be seen. Something is wrong. I was wondering where my mother was, so I decided to walk around our house. I saw blood stains. My heart started pounding after seeing the blood stains, but I did not lose hope. Then I saw a dress that my mother had on the night before. It was torn and had blood all over it. Amir follows the trail of bloody clothing and makes a horrifying discovery. Then I saw the skull. Everything had been taken from the skull. Even the eyes. The skull was all the... So although Pili Legaza's death was tragic, it was not unusual. Then, two months later, an 18-year-old named Musa Mutuba disappears. The next day, his skull is found. At first, his death seems almost unremarkable. But just three days later, someone else disappears. This time, the victim is a teenage boy. At dawn, villagers search for the missing boy. They find a mangled corpse. With this death, it becomes clear. This is more than the occasional random attack that villagers have grown used to. Surrounded by Africa's largest game reserve, the Salu, people here know all too well the risks of living near some of the world's most proficient predators. To reach the fertile fields on the southern bank, they must cross the Rufiji River, passing through waters full of hippos and crocs. In elevated huts, or dungus, they keep watch over their crops for elephants and wild pigs. 
But in the night, carnivores prowl. And chance encounters can turn tragic. A lone human stumbles on the path of a hungry predator and pays the price with their life. Though the victim is mourned, it's accepted as the price of dwelling here. But now, three people are dead. Killed and almost completely consumed, two of them killed just three days apart. Rangers beat the bushes, searching for the perpetrators. What kind of animal could do this? Why did no one hear these killers or the screams of their victims? In southern Tanzania, there are several creatures capable of attacking and eating human prey. African wild dogs hunting in packs. Hyenas, also pack hunters with bone crushing jaws. Or leopards, silent stalkers, usually working alone. The tracks leading away from the scene confirm rangers' worst fears. They point to a formidable suspect. One that hunts and kills with stealth. The six foot long, 500 pound African lion. Lions must seize and consume their prey quickly or risk losing their kills to hyenas. No one heard the blood curdling screams of these victims because they died in an instant dispatched by a masterful, silent predator. Dr. Greg Erickson, a biologist at Florida State University, and Dr. Julian Kerbis Peterhans, a lion expert from the Field Museum in Chicago, investigate the Rafiji attacks. They're not surprised that no one heard screams. Lions generally target a human's head or neck. You just see how much larger the yeah. lion is, and, and sure. you know, easily seizing a person from the head or the neck or even the torso uh, is, is going to cause a you know just a horrific wound. They would attack the person high in these very vulnerable areas. Number one, these areas are vulnerable. Number two, that's the quickest way to get the human being down on the ground. Sure. You know, a human really has, stands no chance against a male right. lion. Yeah. Fear spreads through the villages. Yet farmers remain in the fields, tending to their precious crops. Living with lions is a necessary evil for many people in rural Africa. Everyone must take the proper precautions, stay in groups, and never walk alone at night. But this is... In just two months, in the same area, three people have been killed. And now, the crisis deepens. Little more than a week after the last attack, and over a span of just three days, lions kill three more people. Local officers call for reinforcements, and rangers arrive with orders to shoot to kill. All lions are protected in Tanzania, with one exception, proven man-eaters. The government wants to put a quick end to the bloodshed. But the bloodshed's only just begun. By early November, six people had been killed by lions in southern Tanzania. Nenasi Kanda, a specialist in human-lion conflict, and Haruna Laimo, a wildlife ranger, investigate the crisis. All of these attacks occurred at night, um, under the cover of darkness, uh, 
presumably between 7 o'clock and 9 p.m. All of the attacks occurred in uh, dense vegetation cover and the victims were in all cases caught while they were alone. Perfect conditions for an ambush hunter like a lion. By late November, the death toll has risen to nine. The government sends Ranger Haji Makunguo with more traps and transport. But no matter how hard they try, the Rangers can't locate the killer. Detectives search for a pattern, a signature. The first attack happened at Masen village. The second attack happened at Kilimani village. Perhaps Lyons killed the first two victims out of simple opportunity. Chance encounters between predators and people. But can this explain the attacks on the other victims? There were two months between the first two attacks, then three days to the third. A week, then four attacks within 10 days. The increase in attacks and the shortened time between them suggest a chilling possibility. This was more than just chance. Lions are now stalking people as prey. Once lions begin eating humans, they may continue to do it. Humans are easy prey compared to a gazelle or a water buffalo. Lions expend less energy hunting humans and can consume them quickly so they don't lose protein to scavengers. If these lions have developed a taste for human flesh, they may now be attacking people not by chance, but by choice. The evidence also suggests a frightening possibility. The first two victims were completely devoured within hours of their death. Could a single lion eat so much, so quickly? A lion needs an average of 20 pounds of meat a day, but often goes without food for days. When prey is finally captured, a lion can eat over 55 pounds, but takes over 12 hours to do so. The facts point to one conclusion. There must be more than one man-eater on the prowl. Then, in late November, a tenth attack reveals an even more chilling new development, a strategy investigators have never seen before in man-eaters. Who was victim number 10? That was Saidi Matambwe. At 5 p.m., Saidi Matamwe and his wife Gina say goodnight to his second wife, Nambweki. Most of the farmers here are Muslim, and many have two wives. After supper, she went to her hut to sleep, and I went to bed with my husband. Nambweki returns to her hut. Society keeps a lookout for wild pigs until sundown. Many of his neighbors have abandoned their crops and fled in fear to villages on the north side of the river. Society and a few others chose to stay. But at sundown, everyone goes inside. No one dares to go out into the fields after darkness falls. Around 8 p.m., I heard my co-wife screaming, I am dying. I woke my husband and said, listen, Nayambeki is screaming. Saidi wakes and hears the desperate pleas of his other wife. He 
rushes across the fields to her defense. Mama Nakufa! Baba Bilibi! Mama Nakufa! Mama Nakufa! Only to find that he has become the lion's target. Could it be that the lions were actually setting a trap? It seems um, in this particular attack that the lions have now applied a second strategy which involves panicking people out of their houses and then attacking them somewhere along the way as they're rushing to help. It seems incredible. Lions luring people from the safety of their huts. But lions use a similar strategy to hunt their natural prey. Like all predators, lions often choose the means of obtaining prey that requires the least energy or risk. Rather than attack a dangerous herd of buffalo, lions try to create panic. During the resulting stampede, individuals become separated and the lions make their move. It seems the lions took that same approach when they stalked and killed Saidi Matamwe. Now, is anyone safe? Where will they strike next? On the morning after the attack on Saidi Mutombwe, Ranger Haji Mukungu finds the remains. The body is only partially consumed. For the ranger, this grisly discovery could be a break in the case. He hides in the tall grass, for he knows lions often return to reclaim unfinished meals. doesn't have to wait long. Has the man-eater of Rufiji finally been killed? The lion is a mature female, and she's pregnant with four cubs. For investigators, the stakes have suddenly been raised. Lionesses don't get pregnant unless they're in a pride. A lion pride is a tightly knit group of related adult females. They're dependent young and a coalition of immigrant males. They cooperate as a unit to stalk and kill their quarry. Cubs learn to hunt by imitating the lionesses. By age two, they've been taught what is prey and how to catch it. If a lioness is a man-eater, the art of killing human prey could be passed on, taught to cubs. Unless it is stopped, the practice of man-eating could persist for generations. In Tanzania between 1932 and 1947, three generations of lions killed a reported 1,500 people in the Njombi district, just 250 miles from Ufiji. How long has this lioness been hunting people? How many of her companions share her taste for human flesh? How many other young lions have been trained to see people as prey? News of the dead lion spreads. Farmers return to the fields, hoping they're finally safe. And they seem to be for eight days. A 70-year-old woman becomes victim number 11. 
villagers hear the attack, but no one dares to come to the rescue. All they can do is listen to the killing. Over the coming weeks and months, the death toll continues to rise. Have rangers killed the wrong lion? Or is this the work of another member of the same pride? The answer is astounding. Eyewitnesses report that the most recent killings are all the work of just one lion, with a distinctive wound on its neck. They call it Osama, after the world's most notorious terrorist. Rangers search day after day, night after night. Over the course of several months, they track down and kill ten lions. But still, the deaths continue. At times, Ranger Haji Makongru and his team hunt through the night, only to find the next morning that the killer has claimed another victim, less than 100 yards from their post. The man-eater of Rufiji seems unstoppable. Villagers whisper about a spirit lion, an evil beast who can remain invisible to human eyes. To catch a killer like that, Ranger Hajimant Nguru needs a special kind of help. A team of local bush doctors perform rituals over him in order to defeat the lion's deadly magic. The ranger's face is anointed with a traditional medicine. Bush doctors believe it will give him the power to see the invisible lion. For weeks, he searches. But the lion continues to elude him. It keeps moving rarely striking in the same place, twice in a row. Once it kills in Garango, the next thing you know it is in Minyera. Once it kills there, it moves on. But it always returns to places where it's killed before. The trail of death runs through every village. Within a year, killings reach a staggering number. Forty-two people are dead. But it's about to get worse. The lion now takes a new step that will leave no one feeling safe anywhere. Fatuma Magaila travels to visit her mother and father in the neighboring village of Kipu. Fatuma is in mourning. Fifteen months ago, she witnessed a lion attack and kill her husband. Before sundown, she eats dinner with her parents, sharing news of the lion's latest attacks. After supper, we talked for a while, then we went to sleep. We were in a deep sleep, then I heard my mother screaming. Investigators Dennis Ikanda and Haruna Laimo returned to examine the site of the recent attack. It's very strong. It's very strong. Yes. Like many of their neighbors, Fatuma's parents had reinforced the walls for additional protection. Claw marks on the wall are clear evidence of the lion's path and its determination to get inside. Using its uh, hind legs, eh? it pushed its way up and then placed its right uh, hind leg here. And then it managed to pull itself and actually uh, stand at this particular point. The man-eater climbed over nine feet up the wall. Tuma and her parents 
was sleeping on the upper level. The lion knew they were there. When the lion got here, it sensed uh, through breathing or even perhaps snoring that people were actually sleeping on the top level floor and not actually on the ground. A cat's hearing is extremely sensitive, allowing it to hear sounds inaudible to human ears. Large ears catch more sound waves, and special muscles allow the cat to rotate 180 degrees to follow the direction of the source. Unlike dogs, cats possess specially designed chambers between the eardrum and the outer ear. These may be inflated, which increases sensitivity and allows them to identify the type and size of prey and its exact location. The lion couldn't see its victims inside the hut, but it could probably hear them breathing. My father was attacked when he tried to rescue my mother. When the lion saw that my father was fighting, it grabbed him by the throat and killed him. And left him there and took my mother. Fatuma's mother and father perished. Why did she survive? I was just still and quiet. I was very scared. I was shaking. I did not cry. I knew that if I made a sound, we would all be taken. As she watched in horror, she knew she would only live by staying quiet. She knew this because she had witnessed another attack by the same lion. She'd watched in terror as it killed her husband. Just as it was now killing her parents. The fields of Ufiji are abandoned. The remaining farmers flee to the north side of the river, far from the man-eater. Here, they believe they're safe. But they're wrong. For soon, a lion is spotted swimming across the river. Having preyed upon dozens of human victims south of the river, would the man-eater of Rufiji continue killing on the north side? Unlike tigers, which can swim for several miles, lions don't like to swim. Unless they have a good reason. Within days of being spotted crossing the river, the lion strikes again. Two old women become victims 48 and 49. Once again, government ranger Haji Makanguru is called to the scene. The tracks are fresh. The lion must be close. News of the lion's presence spreads like wildfire. A mob gathers, thirsty for revenge. They beat a trail along the river, trying to flush the lion out. Haji Mekanguru takes up an elevated position. If the lion breaks cover, he may have a chance to finally end the reign of terror. Before long, it appears. Several bullets find their target. The marks on the lion's neck leave no doubt. This is the lion eyewitnesses saw at earlier killings. The lion was brought around to all the villages to show people the lion was dead. Then the lion was taken back to the area where it was killed. After skinning the lion and removing the bones, the villagers cut the meat and ate it as a sign of revenge. It 
seems one of the largest outbreaks of man-eating ever recorded is finally over. A total of 49 people are dead. But what could have caused this lion to kill and eat so many people? Julian, here's the Rafiji man-eater, and uh, you can see it's a, a very large lion. The huge body size can certainly indicate something that's reached adult, adulthood in terms of size and body weight. I mean, I'm just guessing, but over 400 pounds is Yeah, I would certainly think so, yeah. Wow. Somewhere between uh, 450, maybe. That's a big cat. Yeah. Greg Erickson and Julian Kerbis Peter Hans search for clues. Anything out of the ordinary. The lion appears to be healthy. Approximately three and a half years old. But there is something unusual about him. You know, most big male lions would have a much larger mane. Uh, I suspect he, the ears would be covered as, mm -hmm. to a much greater degree, and this would extend way back onto the... Behind the neck and Behind the neck and up onto the back and, and down the, the, the neck region, all that sort of thing. Um, that's not what we're seeing here. So. The lion is a maneless male. It's an eerie parallel to one of the most notorious cases of man-eating in African history. In 1898, two male lions, known as the man-eaters of Savo, preyed on workers building a railway from Kenya to Uganda. An estimated 135 people died. The Savo lions were also maneless, just like the man-eater of Rufiji. Lions are the only cats with manes, and no one's quite sure why they developed them. The mane may serve to attract females, signifying vitality and strength, or serve to intimidate rivals and protect the neck during a fight. At three and a half years of age, the Rufiji man-eater should have had a mane. Could this unusual trait somehow be connected to man-eating? So what do we have here, Julian? Investigators turn once more to the pattern of the incidents, plotting the dates of each attack in the outbreak. Julian, it seems to me that there's, you know, this is quite a string of attacks in a row here. That four or five month period, they really did seem to be focusing on the people in this particular vicinity south of the Rufiji River. But there are other times where they essentially disappeared. So yeah. they really were sporadic. It's curious because in the Savo incident, exact same thing happened. Despite the carnage there, over 30 people killed for sure. There was about a four month interval where the lions simply disappeared. But there are the attacks times. spiked between November and January, and again between April and June. Over 75% of the attacks were during this period. In Tanzania, these months are the seasons of rain. During dry season, lions have no trouble finding their preferred prey. Zebras and wildebeest are always to be found near rivers and lakes. But during the rainy season, as water pools form elsewhere, these animals disperse and become harder to find. Hungry lions must leave their hunting grounds and seek out alternative prey. And here, they find an abundant source of meat wandering around the ripening crops, bush pigs and warthogs. But the bush pigs lead the lions straight to another abundant source of meat, humans. The man-eater of Rufiji may have begun by preying on bush pigs, but soon graduated to people. This may explain why the attacks increased or decreased with the seasons, and how lions developed a taste for human flesh. The seasons and the bush pigs have come and gone for centuries. Yet there are just a few documented outbreaks of man-eating in the past 110 years. Something else must be at work. Something else must be driving this lion to 
target people as prey. Searching for clues, Erickson and Curvis Peter Hans examine a cast of the skull of the Sabo man-eater of 1898. The left canine tooth is normal, perfectly vertical, but the right canine is tilted forward at a 45 degree angle. When you join these two oh, structures, yeah. these canines keep each other in line. So here, we've got the two vertical canines kind of essentially rubbing up against each other, stabilizing each other. But on this side, if we rotate it over, this lower right canine is completely broken at the base. Wow. And therefore, it has not been able to guide the upper canine. And they're both out of whack. They're both kind of uh, joining right here hmm. instead of coming up and down like that. One of the man-eating lions of Sabo had a broken canine tooth and other serious dental damage. How did this happen? And could it have turned him into a man-eater? A big cat's teeth are his most prized possessions, the essential tools of a dedicated carnivore. But teeth can break. Catching prey is a dangerous and unpredictable task. Hundreds of pounds of bite force pressure are required to choke the life from large prey. And the hooves of twisting zebra and buffalo can shatter teeth and jaws, causing irreparable damage. But could bad teeth affect a lion's behavior? This tooth is still alive. You can see the pink there. Um, this tooth is, you can see the pus coming out of there. Dr. Brooke Nemick is a big cat dentist based in California. Randy Miller, a lion trainer, has brought him a three-year-old lion named Wazoo. The lion is suffering from severe dental problems. Tooth 204 is fractured. Think of any time that you've had a toothache, multiply it by about a zillion. They're, you know, living, you know, hand to mouth, to meal to meal. If they lose one meal, that might be the difference between life and death. So an animal that has a bad dental problem, I mean, it could kill them. Plain and simple. Damaged teeth might lead a lion to seek easier prey. When it hurts at the beginning, you know, when they first get it, they're probably going to want to decrease, you know, their biting because every time they bite, they, they hurt. Um, and so they might want to decrease their biting and they may want to go more with their paws um, than with biting. And I would imagine that if the first time that they bite on something, um, you know, and it hurts, they probably back off. And so my assumption would be that they might miss a, a meal or two based on the fact that they, they can't eat, you know, because they can't grip because it hurts so bad. Um, but the major problem over time is the fact that we talked about the infection that goes in through these animals. And basically, you know, having an infected tooth just wears down on you every day. It's just, it's just like having a low-grade cold every single day. And these poor animals will just feel it and it will weaken them and weaken them. And eventually, you know, when you're on knife's edge in the wild trying to survive, you know, you need every advantage you can. And, and you know, and you start, you wear down this much and man, it's, it's over. And I can see, you know, a possibility that, you know, and animals that have dental problems um, could be, you know, forced into attacking people. I think anyone would agree that we're a heck of a lot easier to catch than a gazelle. Like this trained lion, the wild man-eater of Savo suffered from serious damage to his canine tooth. Did the man-eater of Ufiji also suffer from such a condition? Investigators examine images of the lion's skull. Julian, I think the most interesting thing about the Rafiji lion is uh, how much it looks just like the Savo 1 lion. Look at this, the, the, the yeah. canine on the left side is perfectly erect and normal, but the right canine here is tilted forward. It's, yeah, it's, it's, God, they're like you know, mirror images of one another. Yeah, absolutely. The similarities are remarkable. Did these injuries hinder the Rafiji lion's ability to kill natural prey? Yeah, you can see the abscess and the, the pulp cavity exposure right through here. You see a little bit of discoloration, uh, perhaps a sign of infection. We see a split in the canine. How is that going to affect an animal like this, his ability to uh, bring down prey? Well, it will sure, certainly affect its stabbing ability and its, its lethal ability will be affected. From this view, I would certainly think that this might be a, a traumatic break that could have affected its uh, killing behavior. The abscess and the damage to his teeth could have forced the lion to adopt a different diet. 
Something slower, more fragile, softer. Something like humans. They could have turned him from an ordinary lion into the Rufici man-eater. After the lion Osama is finally killed, the people of Rufiji breathe a sigh of relief. Their days and nights of terror seem to be over. But just one day after the death of the man-eater, a 22-year-old named Amir Kari is killed by a lion. Could yet another man-eater be on the prowl? Is the outbreak continuing? With time, the answer becomes clear. There have been a few sporadic attacks, but no further outbreaks in Rufiji. For now, any man-eating lions here have returned to their prides in the Salu Game Reserve. It's impossible to know if more feline hunters have been schooled by their fellow cats to know that humans are easy and available prey. Even without further outbreaks, tragic encounters between lions and humans seem inevitable. People here have lived with that reality for centuries, and it's not likely to change. As long as humans continue to inhabit land, also claimed by other creatures, there will be times when we find ourselves not the hunters, but the hunted.